Glenda Bloom from United Methodist News Services New York office who will be moderating this panel. Thank you. Good morning for those of you who are inside here. Uh, I wanted to tell you that our goal for this presentation is not to offer a laundry list of resolutions being submitted to general conference on social issues, but more of a conversation about the church's commitment to address a broad range of social topics. Um, normally, petitions on these issues take a long time to prepare, and this year those issues will include racism, mass incarceration, religious freedom, immigration, and climate change, just to name a few. But occasionally, General Conference will act spontaneously as events unfold outside the convention hall. This was true during the 1992 General Conference in Louisville, when riots broke out in Los Angeles after a jury acquitted four white police officers accused of beating an African-American man named Rodney King. A group of church leaders decided that General Conference needed to respond to what had become a crisis in Los Angeles. The result was the Shalom Initiative, a denomination-wide program of Shalom Zones that um, addressed justice issues and assessed the needs and assets of specific communities. This strategy for ministry, now called Communities of Shalom, went global and was celebrated at the 2012 General Conference in Tampa. But it wasn't celebrated by all in 1992. As Rich Peck, a communicator and General Conference veteran, wrote in 2012, quote, while some regret that the issue sidelined the assembly, I rejoice in the fact that the denominations set aside its carefully planned agenda to address a world event. I, too, appreciate our denomination's willingness and ability to accompany its words with actions. We're going to hear more about that now from our panel, and let me introduce them to you. And we will start directly on my left with the Rever Reverend Tyler Amundsen, a delegate from the Yellowstone Conference, sorry, and member of the Division on Ministries with Young People of Discipleship Ministries. Next to him is the Reverend Cedric Bridgeforth, chairperson of Black Methodists for Church Renewal and a delegate with the California Pacific Conference. Next to him is the Reverend Dan R. Dick, a member of the General Board of Church and Society and assistant to the bishop and a delegate from the Wisconsin Conference. And after that is Christine Flick, a delegate from the Germany South Conference and member of the General Conference Commission and the Standing Commission on Central Conference Matters. And finally, we have Kirsty Jenkinson, who is Managing Director, Sustainable Investment Strategies for West Path Investment Management Division of the General Board of Pension and Health Benefits. And welcome to you all, and thank you for participating today. Uh, we're going to start out with each of our panelists taking about five minutes to talk about which uh, petitions and social concerns are, Im are particularly important to them at this general conference and how they hope general conference might act on those issues. So I will start with Tyler. Well, good morning. Uh, as Cedric just said, we know how to clear a room for this uh, session. So <laughs> um, I want to speak uh, as a member of the Division on Young People's Ministries. Uh, and it's kind of an awkward place to be, because it's like I'm speaking for all young people in the church in some ways, which we are as diverse as everyone else in the church. So uh, for me to say I speak with a voice for all young people is not entirely true. On social issues, uh, we range in a wide variety of ways. And that was very clear at the Global Young People's Convocation in the Philippines in 2014. 
Um, however, one of the most amazing things that came out of that convocation was a commitment that we want to remain unified as a church as we tackle social issues as a church. Um, and there was a great statement that came out of that conference. As a young adult pastor, one of the things I found about social issues and the way that General Conference acts on them and has them present for us in the Book of Discipline and the Book of Resolutions is that that voice is very helpful as an evangelistic tool, a way to reach out to our communities on social issues to say that we want to make a difference in our communities. As I often teach in a new member class at our church, John Wesley taught us that along with Bibles, we bring blankets. And social issues are an incredibly important part of that. So as I said, young people are diverse on these in so many ways. And in your ADCA, as you look at the petitions that young people have brought, you'll see them listed under a section, uh, the legislative assembly, young people's legislative assembly. If you search that, you'll easily find those petitions. Um, the petitions that we passed as young people range on a wide variety of topics and in fact uh, play into some of the other uh, issues you'll hear from the other uh, panelists today. Uh, one of the big ones that was discussed is an uh, environmental responsibility. Um, for a global church of young people that are looking at the future, our environmental responsibility is incredibly important. We need to see us as a church make a stand on how we uh, engage environmental issues and continue to do that. You also uh, see pieces of inclusion from that group, um, and we had as many disagreements as you heard in the last hour as young people on that. We're seeking ways of how to do that. And I want to say to that that the Young People's Convocation and the Division on Young People's Ministries have had long conversations about how General Conference is teaching young people how to have conversation about tough subjects. We need to continue to look for new ways to do that. Uh, finally, I just want to say uh, the young people have several other petitions as a social issue about how we include young people in the church continually. Um, that is an incredibly important piece of what we do. We demonstrate to the world how you need all ages to be able to come to conclusions on social issues to make a big difference. So again, I encourage you to look in your ADCA for the petitions that young people have passed at the Young People's Legislative Assembly in the Philippines in 2014. And thank you uh, for hearing me out today. Cedric. As shared, my name is Cedric Bridgeforth. I am currently the chair of Black Methodist for Church Renewal, and I stand here today proud to serve in that office. I also stand as a member organization within the Inter-Ethnic Strategy Development Group, which comprises, all, which has all five of our racial ethnic caucuses as members. And our caucuses are Black Methodist for Church Renewal, Marcha, uh, our Native American International Caucus, our National Asian American Federation for United Methodists, and our Pacific Islander Commission for United Methodists. And what I want to share today is not about specific resolutions that have been put forth, but I want to talk about the principles that inspire our work and our witness as racial ethnic people within the United Methodist Church. I must also add um, sort of an asterisk or a disclaimer that um, I would like for us to get to a day when we no longer use the term racial ethnic because usually when we use it we just mean non-white so if that's what we mean why don't we just say it because all of us are of some racial or ethnic category of some sort but we're not here to do that today and so collectively our caucuses work together and all of us are uh, commissioned to work toward uh, issues around advocacy and awareness. That's different from the racial ethnic plans that mainly deal with programming and leadership development. But all of us work together to advance the causes that are important to us. And we count on the work of agencies like the General Commission on Religion and Race and COSRO and the UMW and others to support our work to help men, women, and children be the individuals that God has called them to be in community together. 
So as you look at your ADCA and the other documents that will come to you, you will see many resolutions on racism, poverty, classism, and gender equity. And some of you may ask, why are we still having these conversations in 2016? Well, let me tell you, these conversations are very important and until all of us can come together and be in space together and not count on our divisions to move us along, we will need to have such conversations. Let me frame it this way. Last year, I was privileged to attend a round table, mission round table discussion hosted by the General Board of Global Ministries in the Caribbean, and it was a consultation with the Methodist Church of the Caribbean and the Americas. And uh, there were representatives from various groups around the table, and church leaders from the churches in the Southern Caribbean, all of whom were black. And so each of the groups that came from the US presented what we worked on. So we had Black Methods for Church Renewal. I shared what we did. We talked about the uh, black pastors, African-American pastors convocation. Uh, black clergy women had a presentation. Strength of the Black Church for the 21st Century had a conversation. And when we finished that, we were in small group and one of the men said to me, um, I don't know why you're talking to us about racism. We do not have that problem here. And I said, oh. <laughs> but based on what I've seen, sir, you do experience a great deal of classism. And there is great poverty around you. And all of it stems from the same basis of evil. So might we have that conversation together? And he said, of course. And he went on to tell me how classism really drives what happens in their region of the world. And so as we think about the changing demographics in the United States and our emerging understanding of the realities faced by our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world and from, and from other parts of the world, our fight for racial equity and full inclusion must continue. And we talk about equity, not equality, because equity is the quality of being fair and impartial. I don't think I'll ever be equal to anyone in this room. I don't think I'll ever be equal to anyone beyond this room, but I think all of us deserve equity when it comes to making decisions that impact our lives and our livelihood. So there are lessons that we've learned in doing this work together. Three, and they're very quick. One, that we cannot love pieces and parts of people. We cannot love pieces and parts of people, no matter what they look like on the outside. Second lesson is we cannot assume the external or the superficial knowing of another is indeed relationship. Like when we come together around these tables and we say hi to one another and we, you know, see where people are from and we think, oh, I know that person, or we simply share one meal and think we've really built a long lasting relationship. This work calls for us to go and to look much deeper. The third lesson is we cannot ignore the deepening intersections where we do life, where we experience love and express our faith. Because all of us come to the table with a certain racial or ethnic identity, our class, our gender, our tribal cultures, our age, our religion, our liturgical backgrounds, and our liturgical homelands and preferences. For our racial ethnic caucuses, our work has moved from that of the margins to the intersections so that all of us may know that we are not single issue people with single issue lives, but we bring all of ourselves to this work. And so as you read through the legislation and the resolutions that come forth, know that they are put forth so that we can have an honest, open dialogue about bringing an end to injustices around race, poverty, sexism, and all the isms and phobias that cause us deep hurt and pain. And may we act as God would have us act, as faithful individuals. Thank you, Cedric. Dan. Good morning. So, social responsibility. 
we're for it. <laughs> the General Board of Church and Society thinks it's a really good idea. General Board of Church and Society deeply resonates with this year's General Conference theme, therefore go, because where we're supposed to go is out into the world, out into our communities. Since 2008, when we amended our mission statement to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, General Board of Church and Society has worked to resource and equip and support ministries throughout our church at all levels in that ministry of transformation of the world. Therefore, go is really a challenge to us in the church to answer the question, you know, what do we do with a bunch of disciples once they're made? We send them out to transform the world. And so we do bring a lot of resolutions, new resolutions and some resolutions that need to be revised and amended and edited, all with the desire to streamline and make more accessible and more easily applicable the practices of the United Methodist Church that help us transform the world. We have many resolutions. Some of them are very much centered in the United States. Some of them are worldwide resolutions. But all of them are founded in a desire to respect the dignity of all people, to promote peace and justice and reconciliation and abundant community wherever possible, and to educate and inform and raise awareness throughout the whole church about these critical issues. There's so much misinformation, there's so much rhetoric, there's so much posturing around critical issues of justice and peace, and kindness and compassion. We need to challenge the church continually not to just make superficial decisions and accept things at face value, but to really get down deep and understand what some of these issues are. Now, the General Board of Church and Society, and, and really almost every Christian who commits to works of justice, come under criticism that they're being more politically focused than spiritually focused. Often the criticism is that we're against things. We're against everything. We're against corporations, we're against businesses that, that don't do what we want them to, that we're against. And, and indeed, we are against things. We're against those forces of violence and destruction. We're against injustice and prejudice. We are against trying to apply simplistic answers to complex problems. But what we are for is a world where everyone feels safe, a world where everyone feels respected, a world where everyone feels cared for, and a world where everyone, everyone feels that they belong. Social principles that we talked about this morning. This is one of the rare documents. This exists both in our Book of Discipline and it exists in our Book of Resolutions. Now, many of you may know the Book of Resolutions as that which makes the Book of Discipline a two-volume set. <laughs> we don't spend a lot of time in our Book of Resolutions, but where the social principles say what we truly care about and they define for us the position, what do United Methodists believe? This Book of Resolutions talks about how we will live that faith out, how we understand what it means to adopt and embrace and live our social principles. This book is organized around the six categories, paragraph 160 through 165 of our Book of Discipline. I could have a quiz here and see how many of you know them. But around the natural world, 
around the nurturing community, the social community, the political community, the economic community, and the world community. We believe that these are those things that define the world that we need to transform. And so we do have some things that we are focusing on with our natural world. We are concerned about climate change and the wise stewardship of all of God's creation. With the nurturing community, we are concerned about the dignity and rights of all people. We do not endorse or subscribe to any forces that seek to oppress or control. We call for an openness to all God's children, whether we agree with them or not. In the social community, we promote a basic level of health and welfare, of safety and security for all God's people. We believe that violence against women is injustice. Violence against children is injustice. Violence against the poor and the marginalized, those with with physical or mental disabilities, that's injustice. And we as the body of Christ need to stand for those people and against those forces that work to oppress them. We want every person, every person to feel valued and loved. Globally, we want to stand united against violence against gun violence, not against guns, but against gun violence that is ripping families apart, tearing communities, destroying a basic standard of life. We live in a world of migrants. We all come from somewhere and most of us are heading somewhere else. We would love to cast a biblical and theological vision for one global family, diverse and different, yet all loved and welcomed. We do stand opposed to those conditions in our world, in our society, particularly this in the United States. Alcoholism is approaching epidemic proportions. And what we're seeing is it's not just among adults, it's not just a crisis on our campuses, we're seeing a, a, a sharp rise in alcoholism among high school and middle school children. The political, the economic, the global concerns that we have, one of the greatest is human trafficking. We are dedicated that we must unite and stand firm as the body of Christ, this must end. And we can only address such tragic realities in partnership, ecumenically, interfaith, politically, and culturally. People are not commodities, and there is no place in the realm of God for human slavery. I need to stop, I can go on and on and on. You will note, if you look in your ADCA, there are a lot of resolutions that have to do with the quality of human life. This is an opportunity for us to say what we believe God wants for all people. And so I encourage you to spend some time and really go through and understand what some of these key resolutions and issues are. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And now we'll welcome Christine. Good morning. We don't have a lot of resolutions or uh, petitions to General Conference from Germany, but there is one that uh, is important for us, and uh, I will int introduce it to you. As in other parts of the world, a social issue we worry about in Germany is the environment and the care for God's creation. And as others all over the world, we consider possibilities to act as a church. The whole creation, the whole earth is God's good creation and has as such an inherent value. We are aware that the current utilization of energy resources threatens this creation fundamentally. 
As members of the United Methodist Church, we are committed to dealing with creation and especially with its resources in a responsible and careful way. In its call to action, God's renewed creation, the Council of Bishops of the United Methodist Church calls for the practice of environmental holiness to conserve national resources and use only renewable resources in every gathering and every ministry of our congregations and church. An important expression of this is the reduction of our carbon footprint with regard to the travel related to the church meetings. This issue has been addressed in previous resolutions, although not in a comprehensive manner as we think. In Germany, we started the journey towards adoption of comprehensive mandatory mobility concepts, and therefore, we submit a, peti a petition which intends that first, for all travel related to the activity of annual, general, jurisdictional, and general conference bodies, a threefold strategy of avoiding, reducing, and offsetting is being pursued and that action will be taken by the General Council of Finance and Administration in cooperation with the General Board of Church and Society to propose mandatory guidelines for climate-friendly travel and for carbon offsetting in the case of unavoidable air travel related to the activities of annual central jurisdictional and general conference bodies. Air travel has a special role. There is a heavy increase in using air travel all over the world, and the emissions related to air travel increased a lot in the last years. Traveling by air also causes additional atmospheric processes affecting the climate. As we are a worldwide church, and we are growing more and more in regions outside the US, traveling, and especially air traveling, is necessary for our connection. The best way to save God's creation would be to use renewable energy. But there are some areas, as for example air travel, we don't have any of it now in sufficient ways. Therefore, at first, we should be busy in avoiding traveling wherever it is possible. Replacing physical meetings through phone or video conferencing is one possibility. However, if you, if you have ever done this, you know not every issue is good for video conferencing. And if you have a video conference of two or three hours, you know that's not the best way. <laughs> <laughs> Next, it, it is if it is necessary, necessary to meet physically, we should look forward to ways to reduce emissions. Sometimes it may be possible to choose less polluting meals, means of travel than air travel. But come from Africa to the US without air travel, that would not be possible. <laughs> and by the way, but by the way, we save money if we are able to avoid or to reduce. Only if there are no ways of avoiding or reducing pollu pollution, we think it is a better way to set the carbon emissions off than to do nothing. By offsetting, a certain amount of carbon is emitted in some part of the world, and at the same time, a climate-protecting project elsewhere seeks to avoid at least this volume of emissions. In other words, it compensates for it. This means that the total amount of worldwide greenhouse gas emissions is not reduced, rather the emitted gases are offset. The principle is based on the notion that the concentration of climate changing gases in the atmosphere is the decisive factor, regardless of where they were emitted. This sets climate change apart from other more local environmental problems, such as water and land pollution. The end of fossil fuel and the research for alternatives should not be replaced by this. This is only a way to reduce the consequences of carbon emissions until we have an alternative in renewable energy. In our feeling and thinking, this is a logical and necessary consequence when the Council of Bishops calls for the practice of environmental holiness to conserve national resources. 
And by the way, it's a very social issue, considering the fact that industri industrialized countries cause most of the emissions and climate protecting projects in most cases take place in, develop in developing countries and help there to better lives. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, and now we'll hear from Kirsty. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here representing the General Board of Pension and Health Benefits and lead their Sustainable Investment Strategies teams. One of the, uh, well, the two issues that I'd like to raise that I think the General Board of Pensions believes are very important at General Conference and in our work are protecting basic human rights and addressing climate change. And my panelists have already raised the importance of these in their work as well. From the General Board of Pensions perspective, we are long-term investors in global companies. And we focus on two key questions. How do the issues of climate change and human rights affect our investments and the pensions and benefits that we are responsible for delivering to you and to your pastors? And what role can we play in creating sustainable businesses that are good investments and have a positive impact on the earth and its communities? Let me start with the importance of human rights, or more specifically, the responsibility of business to respect human rights. Businesses operate in areas where human rights abuses occur. There are conflict areas, there are areas of weak governance and where the rule of law is weak and doesn't exist. These present risks and challenges to businesses operating there. We want businesses to be sensitive to these risks and be a force for good. In 2011, the United Nations endorsed the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, the first how-to guide for businesses to ensure that they respect human rights. General Conference 2012 requested that the General Board engage with the companies that we invest in and encourage them to adopt the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. This was an important resolution and these principles have formed the basis of our engagement, that's our discussions with companies over the past years, and they will continue to do so for many years to come. Let me now mention the importance of climate change. The negative physical impacts are already being felt, and just this week, in Switzerland, at the World Economic Forum, a report was issued from 750 global risk experts. They put climate change as the most severe economic risk facing the world. As I'm sure many of you know, in Paris in December, 195 of the world's leaders agreed to limit global temperature increases to two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. We are moving towards a lower carbon world. This presents risks to our investments and it also creates huge opportunities for us to invest in companies that can be good for our planet. As many of you know, the Board of Pensions manages $20 billion in assets. It makes us a large investor in over 5,000 companies worldwide. In all our roles across the church, and we've been sharing that over these last couple of days, we share a combined goal of wanting to make a difference. We want to make the world a better place. We want to use the influence and the skills at our disposal to make positive change happen. The General Board is no different in this goal. And our extreme privilege is that we have a seat at the table with many companies that we invest in. And we can use our influence as a shareholder to create change that improves how companies address human rights issues and how they address and manage and mitigate climate change. We strongly believe that companies that manage these two issues will perform better as well, making them better investments and providing better pensions and benefits to our 92,000 participants. And we think that using our voice, engaging them in dialogue, creates positive change and transformation, such an important theme of our gathering here. 
I'm hoping that I'll be able to share some specific examples and proof of how our engagement with companies creates positive change later on this panel. And I'll probably go on and on because I get very excited. Well, we always try and make our voice heard and engage companies in very specific instances, we do identify certain companies where we feel that engagement is unlikely to change their business practices. And if they are exposed to risks relating to human rights and climate change, they may not be good investments for us. Last year, we introduced two guidelines to help us navigate these decisions. As a result of our climate change guideline, we sold a number of companies in the thermal coal sector. Because as challenging as it is for those individuals working in that industry, coal is very carbon intensive and it is being replaced by alternative, cleaner fuels. Thermal coal companies are no longer good investments. Some of you may also have seen press reports last week many of them unfortunately inaccurate, about the implementation of our human rights guideline. This guideline helps us determine if certain companies present too much human rights related risks. As a result of our guideline, we identified a number of high risk countries and regions, 11 specific countries with widespread and documented human rights abuses including Syria, Sudan, Uzbekistan, and others. And we also identified three specific regions of the world which breach international law, including the settlements in the Palestinian territories. We then identified 39 companies with significant operations in these areas that we believe posed a risk to our investments. I just want to take a couple of minutes to stress a few points about these decisions. This guideline applies globally. We are concerned about protecting human rights around the world. Seven companies on our list of 39 were excluded because of their specific and significant nature of their operations in the Israeli settlements. These settlements are considered illegal under international law and in our church resolutions. We continue to invest in other Israeli companies and we are not divesting from Israel, as many headlines have liked to imply. We are not accusing these 39 companies of committing human rights abuses. We think instead that they are exposed to human rights risks and that's not good for our investments. We've spent a lot of time researching how we think about climate change and human rights and implementing these guidelines and really trying to tackle these very complicated issues in a responsible, nuanced, and thoughtful way. I'm really happy to talk to anyone about our methodology, and it's also articulated on the General Board's website. At General Conference, you will definitely hear more about the issue of business and human rights. You will specifically see a focus on many companies operating in Israel and the Palestinian territories. You'll be presented with petitions asking the General Board of Pensions to divest or exclude other companies operating in the Palestinian territories like Caterpillar, Motorola, and HP. The Board of Pensions has analyzed these companies along with many others, and they do not merit exclusion from our funds alongside the other 39 companies. And sadly, mandated divestment from these companies is very unlikely to create what I think we all strive for, which is a just and lasting peace in the Middle East. And at General Conference, you'll also hear about fossil fuel divestment as a means of tackling climate change. You'll be presented with petitions that require the General Board to add an investment screen to exclude coal, oil, and gas companies from our funds. I personally don't think it's effective to demonize fossil fuel companies who, let's not forget, are basically made up of individuals like us and today provide the world with the energy that we still need to function. Instead, I think we at the General Board of Pensions have a very real and a very live opportunity to work with these companies in helping us all move to a cleaner, functioning, clean energy economy. At the World Economic Forum, as I said, which is happening just this week, a lady called Cristina Fuguerez, who many of you might know, is basically, I think, she's probably termed the climate change diplomat of the world, 
And she's been a very effective one too, because she led the recent negotiations which resulted in the Paris Agreement. She said just this week that the oil and gas companies can and must play their part in this economic transition. They have the capital, they have the technology and the engineers to find solutions for our new economy. I think it is tremendously exciting for the United Methodist Church to be part of bringing about this urgent economic transformation rather than walking away from it. That would feel like a dereliction of our duty. I hope that at General Conference, we spend a lot of time talking about human rights and climate change. They're such important issues for the church to address at large and for the General Board of Pensions to respond to in ways that are in line with our mission to provide pension and benefits to our participants, but also in ways that allow us to take advantage of the privileged influence that we have with companies. When we discuss human rights and the role of business and what they can do to protect human rights, I hope we focus on solutions for the world at large and its many, many troubled areas where people are suffering, which includes but is not limited to Israel and the Palestinian territories. When we discuss climate change, I hope we can focus on economic transformation, on positive solutions, on finding areas where there is innovation and inspiration, rather than choosing to walk away from the climate change challenge. Thank you. Okay, we've now heard from everyone. Uh, I'm going to follow up with a question for each panelist. Uh, we've taken a little more time than expected, so I'm going to ask all of you to keep your answers very brief so we can move on to some questions as well. But I'm actually going to start with Kirsty uh, to follow up on your comments. And I was wondering if you could, you know, talk, give me one success story in which it was important to remain invested in a company to see action. Can I, can I give two? Well, let me do two quick ones, because they're different, and then we have quite a few which I like talking about. Let me start with um, Walmart. Uh, I bring Walmart to your attention because this is a case study in persistence, long-term engagement, and the need to use our influence with a very, very large company who, if you can be strategic and get a large company to change the way in which it thinks about its practices, you effectively shift markets and supply chains. So our engagement with Walmart has been over 10 years. And back in the sort of early 2000s, we asked them to publish a sustainability report. Our thinking being that if you start to track data related to more social and environmental issues, that's going to have an impact on how you think about your business, how you report. And we kept pressing them for a number of years. And finally, in 2007, and I'm with a another group of um, faith-based investors that we were working with, they agreed to publish the report. And we were like, great, this is fantastic. But what's been more fantastic is to see the impact that that's had on the company and how it thinks about these issues. So it led to widespread change in the way they ask their suppliers to provide laundry detergent packaging. It's reduced dramatically the way in which we all buy laundry detergent products, reducing waste. And as well, it's also allowed them to scale up the sale of um, low um, emitting um, efficient energy efficient light bulbs. And whilst we still have a lot of work to do engaging Walmart on other issues, it is now the largest consumer of renewable energy in the country. And it's well on its way to achieving its goal of producing zero waste. So when I think about that and the impact that that's having across the retail sector and supply chains around the world, it makes me really excited that I think we were there, a voice with them at the table in 2007, asking them to start thinking about this data. The second issue I'd like to point out, and I, um, this is very live, this only happened last week. I was um, fortunate enough to be on the phone with a number of the board of directors of a very large um, US company that owns um, property miles around um, the country. And um, one of the, I, I should say here, if I'm sure there are some United Methodist women in the audience. Um, thank you for the continued support that you give us on our engagement. And I think this issue might have particular interest to you because it will be one that's dear to your hearts. We have filed, uh, the reason I'm telling you the story about this meeting last week, we filed a number of shareholder resolutions um, at companies that don't have very diverse boards. 
uh, that have a real underrepresentation of women and non-white. I think I'm going to use your term, Cedric. Um, and we believe it's common sense that if you can recruit from the widest pool of talent, you're going to get the best leaders. And if you get leaders representing all of our society, you're going to inspire people to be the leaders of the future. Uh, so this is why we filed these shareholder resolutions. And last week, we had the discussion with the sole female director of this very large company and two of her colleagues. And what was so exciting to me was um, the fact that they said, thank you for the tone and how constructive your engagement is. That's why we wanted to speak to you. That's why we want to have a discussion about this topic. We think it's important and we think we are behind. And by the way, we're going to be appointing a new woman to our board and we hope that you can support us in that. And this is one of those moments where you do a happy dance and think, yippee, I wish all these engagements were <laughs> so simple. But it's very live, it's very real, and to me it shows the role that we can play in creating the diverse leaders of the future, which I think our church is so urgently and desperately wanting. Thank you very much, and we're going to move along very quickly. Um, Christine, uh, as a delegate from Germany, I'm wondering if you could talk about how we could prioritize um, concerns from one area to another, and do you see, for example, the topmost concerns being the same from region to region, or are they different? We all are called to make disciples for, uh, of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. The contexts in which we are serving and the cultural backgrounds are very diverse. And if we want to show our people at home how Jesus loves, the, loves them, we have to meet them in their cultural background on a level playing field. And I think this is diverse in the various parts of the world. And the regional topics also are very different. In Germany, for example, the question how to receive the refugees with dignity and care and how we con uh, can connect with partners in our connection with regard to migration is more upfront than human sexuality. Although many people wish more space for openness for pastoral signs, like blessings for homosexual partnerships. And I think all over the world, the, the topics depend on the social situation, on the political situ situation, on the cultural backgrounds, on the history of the persons. They can't be the same all over the world. And so I think the directions outlined by the Standing Committee and Central Conference Matters and the CT point us in the right direction for our church. Okay. And Tyler, going to a different kind of diversity, um, how do you think that young people can inform the perspectives of General Conference? What, what can youth bring to this? Uh, one of the things I think I really want to point out is, uh, and Cedric was pointing this out too, uh, young people's lives are as complex and diverse as adults. Um, and just for an example, I'm a young adult who's a pastor. My wife's in the Holy Land right now, and I have two kids in two churches waiting for me at home because the pastors are over there too. <coughs> so there's complexity in our lives, but when we were trying to contribute to the church, we're trying to contribute from that complexity. Um, and we are passionate, passionate about social issues, and when a young person's able to be loved by the church and then can look in the discipline or book of resolutions when they're bored. Um, did you guys catch that? Okay, <laughs> just check in. Uh, and see what the church says, um, that informs us on a social level back at home too. So I, I guess I just really wanna reiterate the point, what we say here matters, and how we do what we do matters. Um, and how it teaches young people, but also how young people start to inform that. Okay. And Cedric, one of the issues that may hopefully come up at General Conference is the concerns the church has had and the country in the U.S. in particular has had about police and on black violence, uh, particularly over the past year. And how does adopting resolutions that we may bring help the church dress this problem, do you think? I just wanted to watch the countdown here. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the church uh, passing resolutions is one thing, but I think having the church really understand what's made the resolutions possible, uh, uh, 
necessary is most important. Because uh, whether or not we pass a resolution uh, really is not going to matter if we don't actually care about the lives of young men and women who are criminalized from the day they enter this world. I mean, as long as, and I get my 10 seconds back. All right. <laughs> as long as we live in a country where we are okay with one in 15 African American men and one in 36 Hispanic men and one in 106 white men being incarcerated, it doesn't matter what resolutions we pass. If we don't think that matters, then we have a heart problem uh, that needs uh, to be fixed. Whenever we live in a country where we are silent on the fact that whenever a young person of color in a high school uh, has some sort of infraction, they get passed on to local law enforcement, whereas a non, um, yeah, whereas a white counterpart gets sent home to mom and dad to address the situation, we have a heart problem that needs to be addressed. And so we have to continue to do all we can to uh, change those systems. And so hopefully the resolutions just highlight the fact that we have some major problems in all of our communities because all of us are a part of the same communities. And unless we see it that way, we'll continue to allow the problems to, uh, to just persist. And we'll think that as long as it's not happening in my neighborhood that I'm okay. But uh, what you need to know is that I live in your neighborhood and I am not okay. And that needs to matter. Thank you. So Dan, um, and as we know, the, the book of resolutions seems to grow fatter each <laughs> general conference. How does the Board of Church and Society, once a general conference is finished, prioritize the actions that have happened and, and work on uh, those issues? This book is not a great bedtime read. It's, it's really short on character and plot and style. What I would say is, is I would kind of challenge and invite all of the delegates to kind of adopt an approach to these resolutions, I can guarantee you, you leaf through this book, you leaf through the resolutions in the ADCA, I guarantee you will find something to disagree with and really not like. At the same time, I guarantee you can find something that you are deeply passionate and concerned about. And so I'm asking everyone to make a choice. Choose to pursue that which you care most deeply about. And don't give so much energy to those things that you disagree with. Because when we take these resolutions forward, it's what Cedric says, we can vote something down, and the day we vote it down, we're done with it. But the problem is, a lot of times we vote things up and we're done with them. We need people to follow their passion, to use their God-given gifts, to really sort through. We individually or even congregationally can't do all these things, but we can all do something, and I just feel that the, that the real great need, the prioritization that has to happen, is that we give our energy to that which we want to create and see succeed and not give so much energy to defeating the things we dislike. Thank you very much, and I appreciate everyone um, watching the time because we now have about 18 minutes left for questions. Uh, the drill is the same as before. You can line up at the microphone, um, give us your name and where you're from. Um, and okay. Yes, please. Michael, Yo uh, Michael Yoshi from uh, California, Nevada, annual conference. I also happen to co-chair United Methodist Kairos Response, which has been in existence since 2010, working with Palestinian Christians uh, after their issue, uh, issuance of the Kairos Palestine document in 2009. Um, first of all, I want to uh, say a word of commendation for the Board of Pensions and Kersey's work in the human rights guidelines for them and also their recent 
um, exclusions of the three companies doing work in the illegal settlements in Palestine. Um, very important work, and we consider that to be a, a first good step, uh, but a first step. And um, there are resolutions coming before the body, and I wanted to uh, ask Dan to speak to the resolutions coming forth from GBCS around the um, Palestinian situation, and also to Tyler, there was a resolution that came out of the Philippines uh, Global Youth Forum as well. And then Sidrick, I wanted to ask you to comment on um, the fact that you, I really appreciate how you said for racial ethnic communities, we need to move from the margins to the intersections, and there's been Okay, we're, we're trying to watch our time, so. Now, <laughs> okay, all right, okay. I think we can start with Dan. Okay, well, to, to begin with that, I, and I think this, this ties in um, so well with what was said before. Um, especially the, the, the idea of, of um, the uh, resolution of Caterpillar um, what we're really trying to get at, we're not against individuals, we're not against groups, we're not really trying to draw sides as much as we are trying to focus on those actions and behaviors and practices that are perpetuating problems, that are perpetuating the violence, that are, that are consistently destructive, and where we have not had uh, an open engagement to, to talk about what the alternatives are. And so we're really pushing to, to um, <laughs> use the cliche yeah. of, of... And let me remind you, we're trying to limit to one minute. Oh, well, thank answers. you. <laughs> well, then, Tyler, why <laughs> don't you go? <laughs> okay. Uh, I think uh, for young people, uh, one of the questions here for me is, uh, this is absolutely is about young people being interested in being responsible investors, as Christy was talking about. And for me, this actually plays into the conversation of uh, how do we make sure young people are better represented across the church so that we're in the conversation with GCBS and with the Board of Pensions as a part of this, and less about just our individual petition, because our individual petition addresses that exact issue of responsible investment. So it's more about inclusion of folks in those conversations. Can I just add to that is we had one of the best meetings I think we've had at the General Board of Pensions with five young leaders, actually more, six, who came to our offices and spent the day trying to give us feedback and it was so helpful. So please, that engagement is so welcome. Okay, and, and first of all, I have to apologize to Dan. I, they have one minute, you have two minutes. So if you want to speak a little bit longer, you can. On, I'm good. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll go to this microphone. Hi, uh, I apologize, I'm on the phone. I'm trying to get a flight back and uh, <laughs> I'm unsuccessful. So it's not God, it's United Airlines. <laughs> my um, question, uh, my name is Tom Lank. I'm uh, the head uh, delegate from Greater New Jersey. And my question is for Kirsty. Um, we had a conversation yesterday and I guess I'm still struggling with um, the idea of whether or not positive change is always the most effective route. Um, I mean, we can think of South Africa in the 1980s and apartheid where sanctions and divestment really were effective. Under what conditions would pension and health benefits uh, see divestment as a good option? And the other part of that question for me is how are you working with Board of Church and Society um, to try to merge uh, resources and tactics. Okay. So it, let me take the second question first, which I think is perhaps most important in terms of how are the General Secretary of Board and Pensions and Church and Society and two of the other general agencies as well come together regularly to talk about these issues and, and really ensure that we try and have a common voice and a common understanding of positions on it. And that filters down very much to, I think, the staff and how we try and cooperate on that and reach a sort of a common ground on issues that are important. And the second question, I, I, or the first part of your question, let me take that in terms of, is positive engagement always the best route? Are there alternative strategies? I've, I've highlighted specifically where we believe that there is an appropriate time to not invest in a company. And I've tried to make that very clear that that happens within 
the boundaries that we work with. And the best way I can think of explaining this is if you imagine sort of um, one circle of, of financial performance and another circle of kind of like moral issues or moral stances and, and imagine these two circles and they kind of overlap. And in the middle, that's where the board of pensions can be most effective, where our engagement can play out both in financial and in moral terms. And where I think the moral only part of the circle, which doesn't overlap, that's where the rest of the church has an amazing role to play. And so I think if we are not, as the board of pensions, using, the, we have to, an obligation to our participants. And, and this isn't just something which we make up. I mean, if we can't look at the people who we are, have to provide retirement benefits to in the eye and say we have met our obligations, we're not fulfilling what we're tasked to do. But at the same time, we recognize that there is a huge overlap between moral issues and financial issues that we will play a role in. But if it's just moral, then let's make sure the rest of the church focuses on that and we bring our strength together as a whole organization to play where we can have the most impact. And I like us to focus where we have the most impact. Okay, thank you, Kirsty. Um, this is the microphone. Good morning, my name is Jenny Phillips. I'm Minister for Environmental Stewardship and Advocacy in the Pacific Northwest Conference. Uh, I have a question for Kirsty as well. Um, we have more than half a billion dollars invested in the top 200 fossil fuel companies. The church has a deep entrenched financial interest in the success of the fossil fuel industry and the continued profitability of the fossil fuel industry. And yet our clergy are in ministry with people around the world who are suffering the impacts of climate change. You talked a little bit about the, the moral voice of the church, and I'm deeply concerned about the moral message that we're sending when we have such deep okay, investments Jenny, I need in a the question. fossil fuel industry. And so I, I, I'm wondering how can we send a different message than the one we're sending when we say we, we have to stay invested? Let me respond to that question by saying and giving you examples of where the, the fossil fuel industry, I think we will look back at this time in history and say this is when the world at large realized that we had to transition to a different style of ec economic progress where carbon emissions are lower. And I think this is when we will look back and say this is when the oil and gas industry realized that they need to start shifting their business model in order to enable us to use their resources and the scale to get there. And I can point to some very specific examples of this being a turning point. We're engaging a number of oil and gas companies. As Jenny says, we do invest in fossil fuel companies. We're engaging them and we are hearing positive responses. ConocoPhillips, we asked them to publish a strategic review of how they're thinking about climate change. They did it, they're the first oil and gas company here in the US to do it. Now I'm not saying that all the other companies here are where they are, but we have a role to play. If this industry can shift, we are going to get to a lower carbon economy much quicker than if it doesn't. And that's what I think we need to be focusing on. Climate change and mitigation is the end goal. How can we ensure that we mitigate it fastest? There are other examples. I probably don't have time, but I can cite specific examples from Europe, from BP, from Shell, from Total, from any. I'm not saying that they are perfect in terms of leading the transition, but the world is changing. They are changing. We have to stay engaged to make that change happen. Thank you. Next microphone. Thank you. I'm Jim Nibelink, lay delegate, Desert Southwest. Uh, to follow on with the investment conversation, I'd like to ask Dan a question. Uh, relative to Caterpillar, we heard Kirsty mention that. Uh, the resolution that uh, GBCS has promoted uh, to divest from Caterpillar cites a number of interesting challenges in that we have been collectively with several other denominations and organizations constructively engaged with Caterpillar for over 10 years. Their behavior has not changed. Our investment in Caterpillar has increased and yet Caterpillar directly responded to the constructive engagement by saying that they refused to sign the United Nations principles that have been cited as one of our criteria. So tell us a little bit more about GBCS thought process as that resolution was promoted. Thank you. Um, it would be more appropriate for me to um, put John Hill on the spot and uh, say that he can answer that much better than I can. Being a member of the board, I have not been directly involved in some of those conversations, and so 
that for me poses a bit of a problem. And I'm sorry, I don't think we have enough time right. to do that, but I think if you can connect with John afterwards, that might be helpful. I'm, I'm go also to happy to share off the record um, okay. constructive discussions that we have been having with Caterpillar, which I think is appropriate for the audience to know are happening. Um, not later, is that well, what I'm you're saying? I'm presuming I don't have the, I yeah. have the okay. question wasn't addressed to me. Uh, no, we can't do anything off the record in this, in this gathering, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean Please, that. go ahead. Okay. Sid Strebeck, uh, lay leader of New Mexico Annual Conference. A question for Cedric, uh, and we're actively involved in Hispanic ministry in New Mexico, and while uh, I 100% agree, uh, the incarceration of minorities is an indictment of the Methodist Church, I think, uh, and all churches. My question to you is, if we spend our efforts making disciples of minorities and get the numbers to where they more accurately reflect, I mean, we have 1% of our members are Hispanic, and at least in our area, almost half of the people are Hispanic. Uh, is, is, is where do we need to spend our efforts, I guess, is my question. Do we need to be expanding our minority ministries so that uh, we don't have the, uh, will, th will that be a quicker way to solve the problem rather than uh, working with the people that are, uh, I, and I agree, there are people that are. Yeah. I Thank you, got yeah, first. yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I think part of it is we have to acknowledge that as much as we want to do the right thing, I, I believe we ultimately want to do the right thing, I think we have a problem acknowledging the privilege that we all enjoy. And uh, even as an African American male sitting here on this stage, I am privileged. Um, in this setting, somewhat privileged, but even when I return to an African-American community, I still enjoy a certain amount of privilege economically, educationally, and politically if I don't tell my whole story. Uh, you know, so there, there are all kinds of uh, things that we need to acknowledge, but I think, you know, just getting to the heart of who we are, going to those communities where we know we don't have relationship and learn uh, who people are and what they're facing and begin to address the immediate needs that people have will help us strengthen our bonds. And if we do that and care for the human person first and deal with building ministries second, I think we'll get a lot further faster. Okay, now we have about four minutes left and I'm gonna try to get these last two people at the microphone. So I'm asking you to make very quick questions and we'll try to do a quick response, okay? So go ahead. My name's Marie cook -Sanofsky. I'm a lay delegate from the Pacific Northwest and a member of the Board of Global Ministries that is sending the fossil fuel investment screen legislation to General Conference. And I celebrated with many who saw the, the news that the Board of Pensions divested from coal last January, but I was dismayed to see after Arch Coal, the second largest okay, coal company you, I, in I the United States, okay. filed for bankruptcy last week, uh, they filed for bankruptcy last week. We are still, we, we were still invested in them at that point. And I was just wondering, uh, without the guidance of General Conference, how does the Board of Pensions approach that coal divestment that was so celebrated? By implementing the, the guideline, and we have excluded those companies from our portfolio. The position that you're referring to is in a specific fixed income fund where we have a longer time to sell out of it than in others, but everything else you'll see across our portfolio is not invested in coal. There are certain steps that we always have to take to ensure that we fulfill our fiduciary responsibilities, which is what we were doing there. But absolutely, the spirit of the guideline and the belief that climate change is important and that coal is an industry that is not a good investment, absolutely is maintained. Thank you for the question. Thank you. And our last questioner. <laughs> CalPAC Annual Conference and also um, spent 10 years as a former GBGM uh, missionary in uh, Israel-Palestine. So the question to, to Christy, 
You know, after our last uh, general conference in 2012, uh, Board of Pensions actually invested in 10 new companies that are located in the illegal settlements. Um, with the recent activity, it was excellent to go ahead and divest from those um, that you selected. Uh, where are the stances on those other eight that are brand new ones? They're not old ones, they're not ones we've had for a long time. Um, at least six of those have lost money, so it's not a fiduciary responsibility. Is there a conversation about getting rid of those others that are at least those companies that are located in the West Bank and therefore in violation of everything that our church stands for in relationship to human rights as well as uh, fair business practice? As I mentioned, I think what's most important to us is to have a way of dealing with thinking about 5,000 companies that we invest in in a very thoughtful and nuanced manner. And our human rights guideline really helps us do that. And we have a very methodical and a very thoughtful process for thinking about what's the most responsible way that we can think about human rights issues and also financial issues as well. And I think it's very hard to look back on past performance and past holdings. Our holdings change regularly, as you might imagine. And performance, we can never predict the future performance. What we need to do is to do what I think we do well, which is manage investments to make sure that they provide the returns for our participants and for you and for your pastors and take a very clear approach to how we think about human rights issues, not least in Israel and Palestine, as we've documented very clearly just in the last couple of weeks. So I hope people will take the time to read the steps that we've taken and the rationale behind it. It is all very thought out, and I, I really hope that we, we can gain your trust in that that's our role and, and we take it very seriously. I want to thank all our panelists very much for participating today.